All right. With that, we got to move on to our very fourth, our fifth, I guess it is, and final um, session for today, jam-packed day, um, but one that I'm really looking forward to. It's titled Industry's Current Use of Drones for Damage Assessment. And I really uh, enjoy this topic because it truly leverages advanced technology to, to meet a critical need for disaster response. Um, I can tell you that um, I can remember a time when I had to almost force the use of drones for damage assessment. It wasn't that long ago, and it's come such a long way. So I'm really looking forward to introducing uh, you all to uh, Heath McLemore. He's from Florida Power and Light. Um, he is the, uh, I guess his title that, that I can tell is uh, the operations manager for unmanned aerial space, uh, un un unmanned aerial systems, uh, UAS uh, flight at Florida Power and Light. And with that, uh, Heath, um, take it away. I'm really looking forward to this. The I don't know. Heath, we he, lost your your uh, your picture and your sound. Heath. He's he's frozen and uh, muted. So, All right. just bear with us. Like I said, I've, I've I've spent a lot of my career working with the folks uh, around the East Coast, the Southeast Coast, and Florida Pond Light. Um, I got a lot of good friends that are still working there and they are truly um with some of the stuff that they're doing in in the uas uh uh environment are really doing some really neat things there you go heath i can see you're moving I don't, hey you... good afternoon sorry about yeah, that yeah, yeah, there you go so yeah thank you thank you for the introduction uh the great panel just as well uh i echo a lot of that that you, you just said dave uh, it's gonna be a hard act to follow for sure but again, thanks for uh, inviting me to this and, and having me speak on a little bit about what uh, Florida Power and Light is doing today with drones um, and some of our recent experiences, especially this last year, on how we've used drones for emergency, res emergency response situations. So um, let me just get uh, my screen share up here for you and make sure this is working for me. All right. Can I just get a confirmation that you can see me? See yeah, all good. Okay, perfect. So again, uh, my name is Heath McLemore. I am the flight operations manager for unmanned uh, drone operations for the company. Um, give you a little bit of background. Uh, if you're not familiar with Florida Power and Light, we are the largest utility in the state of Florida. We serve uh, approximately 5, 5 million customers within the state of Florida, uh, mostly along the, the entire east coast of the state. Uh, as well as uh, below uh, south of Tampa, and as well as we have uh, many customers out in the Panhandle now as well. So again, I wanted to kind of give you a quick overview of, of our program to begin with. Uh, we are kind of split out uh, in various drone operations across the company. Um, we really focus uh, a lot of time into the what we call the under 55 pound uh, drone operations, as well as there's been a lot of development on large scale, large scale drone operations as well and including uh, a lot of the, the things that we're doing now with all of that data that we're now collecting with our drones. Um, so to kick off, uh, to really kind of focus on Blue Sky, um, I wanted to touch on, you know, kind of what we're, what we're doing day to day on, on Blue Sky drone operations. So this is anything outside of storm events uh, is what we really consider just daily operations, daily Blue Sky operations. Um, so our team was really developed, uh, we, we kicked off, uh, mostly back in 2018 when we actually had a, a, a team built and, and named to just support drone operations for the company. Um, from there, uh, we estimated we did about uh, 1,200 drone flights uh, in 2018. And you can quickly see on, on the side here um, how many flights we've done year to year and, and that exponential growth that we've seen. Um, in 2021, we uh, estimated we did just a, a bit over 120,000 drone flights. Uh, and this is a, a bit older slide, but in 2022, we completed over 145,000 drone flights uh, across the state and across the U.S., supporting some of our other business units across the, the country. So again, uh, it, it puts us, you know, kind of in the seat of we're one of the largest uh, drone operators, uh, we believe, in the country when it comes to 
the daily flight operations we're seeing day to day. Uh, a day like today, um, we're, we're doing anywhere from 50 to 60 drone missions. Now, for us, uh, a drone mission can be anywhere from 15 to 20 drone flights. Um, that is doing anything from inspecting a solar field to uh, inspecting power lines for our distribution teams, for our reliability teams, as well as supporting um, uh, environmental teams, uh, engineering and construction. So whatever it might be, we're, we're kind of the, the central hub uh, and owners and operators for all things drones for the company. So our team is, is set up uh, much like in, in you, you might see an airport for air traffic control. So we, we do uh, all of our mission review and approvals daily in what's like air traffic uh, does at a, at a, at a controlled tower. Um, and we also put a lot of, of time and, and effort into our, our training program. Um, so we have about 70 to 80 internal employees with a company who are drone pilots, but we also have many, many more uh, vendors who work with us day to day to help support our, our needs uh, for drone inspections throughout the company. Um, so we put a lot of effort into our training program that goes beyond the, the FAA Part 107 certification that is required for any commercial drone pilot. Um, so with that, we put most of our pilots, if not all, through our own internal ground school and flight school. So we've really kind of duplicated what you would go through if you were going to get your, your crewed pilot's license, going up to get your Part 61 certification. So it, it really helps us, especially on the safety case, because we also believe we're one of the, the safest drone, drone operators in the country as well. And that really goes to, you know, the quality of the training that we, we put in, into each of our students and our pilots. Um, again, in our, in our overview of our team, again, we're, we're really focused on the safety and as well as the regulatory side uh, of tracking when, where, how we're flying, because again, it goes back to we're, we're flying in, in uh, heavily populated areas. It might be in, in people's neighborhoods. Uh, again, it's going into interacting with customers uh, correct and appropriately and making any kind of notifications to customers because again, we're, we're integrating into uh, areas where customers may not be familiar with, with drones and what we're doing. So there's a lot behind the scenes of, of how we're communicating with, with, with customers and really the future of how we're integrating in drones into our operations uh, to again, at the end is, is to help increase the reliability that we provide to our customers uh, in terms of you know, maintaining the, the infrastructure that we have in place. So today, um, this is some, some pretty cool pictures. This is our latest and greatest uh, uh, FPL Air Command Center. This is where I'm working out of here today. Um, so this isn't a, a uh, a fake background that I'm showing you, but this is probably one of the coolest uh, drone control centers that at least I've ever seen. And I'm very lucky to, to be able to uh, come to work to this in the center day to day. Um, so this center is in West Palm Beach. Uh, this is also connected to our uh, larger building here, the distribution command center, where we manage the daily uh, control of the electrical grid and uh, for FPO in the state. But again, we, we have this room dedicated to just drones. Um, Again, as we've continued to grow and, and build our use cases across the company, we also needed a room to help keep up with that. So again, uh, we've got uh, quite a few seats in this room that again, that we have, uh, we man maintain our daily flight reviews, approvals, uh, like I said, kind of like air traffic control. But this room is also built out for the future of where we see, uh, where we see the drones, um, the future of drones going for, for our company as well. And I'll talk a little more about what we're doing there as well. Uh, a big part of our drone program, we are one of the, the five or six companies in the US that has a strategic partnership with the FAA. Uh, it's called the, the Safety Plan, the PSP program. Um, so you see a couple of other companies, UPS, um, Amazon doing uh, similar projects with the FAA. Except for instead of doing drone deliveries, our program is really based on critical infrastructure inspections, as well as um, uh, using drones for storm response events and how that looks in the future and really trying to push the envelope forward on in how and where and where and, and how we're going to operate drones in the future and where, where we see this technology really benefiting us and our customers in Florida. 
Under our program, um, we're really focused on four main integration goals. Uh, the first big one and the key piece, and if anyone in the drone in industry is the beyond visual line of sight or BB loss. So this is getting the waivers, getting the approvals from the FAA that we can now operate drones outside of the pilot's line of sight and go much further, much longer distances in the future. Um, as well as some of the other ones, the key goals that we have is operations over people, uh, which is uh, again, something you, you have to have uh, certain waivers for, as well as uh, one pilot to many UAs. So this is an uh, instance where you're operating uh, one, one pilot can operate multiple drones at the same time. Now you see this sometimes a day um, in the, the drone light show events, uh, but again, uh, taking that into our operations, it's really focused on how do we operate many drones using one, one pilot at a time so we can cover much more ground uh, faster with, with multiple drones. And then the real key piece that brings all of that together is uh, what we call highly automated operations. So I, I kind of, uh, make fun of this is um, your your Roomba robot at your house, if you have one, is is basically a highly automated robot that can vacuum your floor. So our focus is to duplicate that, but in the drone world. Uh, so in this picture you see here is, is our version of a, a Roomba robot, but for a drone. So this is a highly automated drone that can be pre-programmed to fly our infrastructure. And at a push of a button, um, anywhere that I have internet con connectivity, I can operate that drone and collect images without actually ever having to go to the field. Um, so it's really a key piece uh, of our program with the FAA is how do we get this uh, key piece of highly automated drone flights where we can now operate drones from our control center, just like you saw on the previous slide in the future, um, to, to conduct inspections of our, our infrastructure, our power lines, poles, equipment, substations, and whatever else it might be. Now with this, I'm happy to say we, we had a really exciting week last week. Uh, on Friday, we actually got the, the latest and greatest waiver approved from the FAA. This is something we had been working on for quite a few years, but it, it's one of the first waivers that the FAA has given that integrates all four of these key pieces. Uh, so it was really a huge uh, win for us and a win for our customers on pushing uh, this technology forward to, you know, again, increase the way we operate and increase the way we uh, plan to operate drones in the future in more of a highly automated uh, you know, operation mode. Um, with that, we also are going through a, an extension. So this, the PSP typically is a three-year program. Um, we have just finished the, the first three years of this, but since the, some of the great progress and the great work that's came out of this partnership, uh, we actually just extended that for another three years. So looking, looking forward to continuing that partnership with the FAA and, and pushing this, this technology forward. So to get into more of the, the emergency response side of our business, we are FPL Air is kind of like the, the first in, last out when it comes to the, the situations like you've seen earlier this year for hurricane response. Uh, we have been building our storm strategy from uh, since 2016. So 2016 was the first uh, hurricane, Hurricane Matthew, that we actually deployed some of our first drones just to kind of see what can they do in, in scenarios like that. Um, it, was, it was pretty incredible because it provided, you know, incredible information back to our teams, back to our control centers. Uh, in getting to those inaccessible areas that before we could never even uh, attempt to, at least not in any short matter of time. Uh, so really our, our team has been growing ever since then. Uh, as of today, we have uh, in-house, we, we have a, a 20 plus member team. Uh, so this is a team members that we will bring into our control center, uh, into our offices to really support all of the, the pilots that we have out in the field. This includes in anywhere from incident commanders, um, FAA compliance leads, so someone that's constantly communicating with the FAA on airspace and other things of that matter, as well as operations lead, uh, service leads, much like uh, we're providing service to our distribution teams, we're providing services to uh, environmental teams, uh, marketing and communications is a big one because again, we use drones to communicate uh, images to our customers uh, on what actually uh, things look like out in the field. So uh, again, that team's really grown over the last few years and, and supporting as we grow our use of drones for storm response as well. 
Uh, for us in the field side of things, we have on contract to, to bring in up to 200 plus drone pilots. Um, now, luckily we haven't had to deploy that many yet. Um, I think we've done, uh, I think we did for Hurricane Ian this year, about 70 pilots. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few slides. But again, for us is really having that plan in place. So if and when we need, need that many pilots, we already have a plan in place for that deployment if needed. I uh, talked a little bit about the, the different business units we support, uh, transmission, substation, uh, distribution, veg, uh, marketing, communication. So again, we're not just looking at lines and poles. We're, we're focusing on a lot of other things that, that uh, help support uh, disaster storm response for our customers. Um, some of the other ones, uh, like you see in the top picture here, um, in storm situations, we set up, uh, we can set up multiple what we call staging sites. So this is where we'll basically take over large parking lots. Uh, maybe, uh, I think one of them is Daytona International Speedway, is, which is one of our larger sites that we would set up. So we basically set up small cities, small towns in these sites where you have tents for cots, for sleeping, for crew sleeping quarters. You have tents for... Uh, food services, you have yards to lay out equipment. So again, a big piece of that is uh, we're now using drones to, to scan those areas, 3D map those areas before and after the storm is complete, just to make sure that um, when we go to these locations, we leave that site as good as we found it. Uh, so we're able to create uh, quick maps of those areas um, before and after, and then compare to make sure that we didn't leave any damage, didn't leave anything behind when we're packing up and leaving. So uh, one for us, uh, this is probably a, a good uh, good thing to show, uh, really focusing on well, how can drones, what, what have we learned for, for our operations? How can drones assist during storm events uh, for us? Um, really, and, and I've touched on this a little bit is, is the first one, the main one is the assessment of storm at, you know, uh, at storm landfall location. So what we do uh, when we bring in drone pilots, we will pre-deploy pilots into what we expect and plan to be the hardest hit areas. So they will get pre-deployed, they'll get put in category five hurricane uh, proof hotel accommodations, and they will ride out the storm. So as soon as that storm is passed, they are already boots on the ground, ready to go uh, immediately. And, and as soon as wind speeds will allow them to start collecting information. Um, we are now doing a pre and post storm uh, landfall condition assessments. So with condition assessment is uh, looking at all the poles, all of the equipment on top of the poles. So we can see ahead of time if we have any issues, any piece of equipment they may, that may soon be failing as well as doing that as soon as the storm has passed to make sure the lines are good, the poles are good, the lightning arresters are good, whatever is on the top of the pole uh, is, is, is in good condition. And drones are helping us do that much safer, faster than, than ever, ever before. Uh, a big one for us, number three, is navigating flooded areas. And this was a huge one uh, for, for both hurricanes that we saw this year in the state of Florida. Uh, places like Arcadia, which you probably saw uh, featured on the news with a lot of the flooding, there's areas that we cannot access with, with equipment for, for days, weeks, but the drones were able to get out there, uh, take images, feed those images back to our team so we could see and assess any damage that needs to be repaired. That way our teams knew exactly what equipment, what crews, what, you know, what needed to be uh, put in place so they could quickly and effectively restore power to those customers. Uh, again, you know, I won't focus on and read this all, but again, uh, really it's just uh, navigating inaccessible areas, um, looking at areas of high vegetation, looking for uh, areas where trees are down, trees are knocking, on, knocking down poles, lines. Uh, and again, you know, you know, seven years ago, this was things that we were doing by boats, doing by driving assessments. It was slow. It was not, uh, not really safe at the time. Uh, and again, drones have really changed the way we, we see and we deploy based on certain storm conditions in the future. So getting into um, uh, some of the, the storms that we had this year. So this is uh, really kind of focused on what we experienced during Hurricane Ian. Uh, again, uh, for us, it was a huge event and we, we provided uh, immense value to our, our operations teams during the storm. 
Uh, for Hurricane Ian, we deployed about 66, uh, 66 uh, quite, actually closer to 70 pilots for, for Hurricane Ian. Um, we collected over 50,000 images during about a two week period. Uh, to put that in perspective, Hurricane Irma, uh, which was seven, 2017, uh, we collected about 10,000 images. So again, a big piece of that is, well, now we have 50,000 images. What do we do with all of that? So it's been a, another big learning curve from us as we're collecting more and more data. Well, instead of having someone look at 50,000 images, how can we first get those images from the field faster? Because most of these areas, either you don't have internet connectivity, you don't have cell phone service. So again, the key piece of that is, is working, going through satellite communications using Starlink uh, now, which is, is a great tool for us is, is a, a way to stream those images, get those images back to our control center. We're now putting them up on maps using the geotag data that is embedded within those pictures. And now we can quickly look on a map, see exactly where that pole is that there was a picture taken of and know where that pole is, uh, what's needed to repair it. And then again, like I said, knowing what crews, what equipment to send to that location uh, faster for repairs. We also had a couple of new business cases and we're always learning new things every time we go through a storm event. Um, this year we focused on uh, also looking at all of the substations on the west coast of Florida. So uh, on the west coast we had about 117 substations that were impacted with heavy winds during Hurricane Irma and we had a, a huge ask to go assess every single one of those and, and do it as fast as possible. As well as we had many instances where we had uh, long spans of transmission structures where they were either flooded areas or people, places where we couldn't easily access, even with, with helicopters close enough, where we, we were able to do that with, with drones as well. So with that, um, again, here's an example of some of those long transmission line sections. So uh, one of them is uh, from Arcadia down south. You see the, the taller picture. So that was one span that was about uh, 19 miles section there. And then we had another one uh, around Punta Gorda. So there was a transmission line section going from Punta Gorda to Arcadia, which you can see from the map there, there was nothing there. Um, there was really due to flooding that was completely inaccessible. So really the only tool that we could use was drones. So again, with our partnership with the FAA, we were able to submit emergency waivers to basically shut down and put a TFR over those areas for us so we could quickly get in and fly those as fast as possible. And then I'll touch on this a little bit too. Uh, another new lesson that we learned was with substation inspections. So again, we had 117 substations on the West Coast that all received some sort of impact uh, due to higher wind speeds. And it was a, a big learning curve for us in that, you know, let's use the drones to, to cover that area much faster. So we did with about five drone teams, we covered the entire West Coast that you see in the map there within 48 hours. So we had drone teams going from substation to substation, capturing images just like you see here and providing that information back to our team just to make sure, you know, surveying these to make sure there's no uh, any other debris or damage in these substations. Again, making sure that our reliability stays high, especially in an event of a storm like this. So again, another another huge win for us and something that we're going to continue to do uh, for for future storms as well. So I talk a, a lot about our our small under 55 pound drone program, but uh, another key piece and new tool in our toolbox now is the what we call FPL Air One. So this is a really exciting platform, a drone platform that we've been working on for the last few years. And we actually were able to put it to use for Hurricane Ian for the first time. So what this is, is uh, it is a airplane uh, made originally by Sonex Aircraft. Um, it was originally built, uh, can be built as a kit plane, um, a two-seater kit plane. It is a uh, about a 39, 40 wing, foot wingspan airplane, um, fully loaded with fuel and sensors, can go up to 1,800 pounds. Uh, and a real key piece for this is it can stay airborne for 20 to 25 hours. So this is something we've been, again, with our partnership with the FAA, been working on 
what does the future of large scale drone operations look like, uh, especially in the event of a disaster response situations? So for us, you know, we, we've been working on this project for quite some time. Uh, we have obtained some of the first approvals for, from the FAA of, of using a, a drone of this size, uncrewed aircraft of this size um, outside of, of, of government use, uh, military use. So again, really kind of the first, first of its kind and especially for us in, in the utility industry as well. So for Hurricane Ian, uh, again, uh, we had a, a lot of firsts and a lot of lessons learned as this was the first storm, first deployment of the system. Over about seven day period, we, we did seven flights, uh, totaling about 24 and a half hours of flight time uh, with a total distance flown of just over 2000 miles. Uh, so again, it was, it was a huge you know, test of this system and a huge benefit uh, as we uh, learned a lot and then you know, are able to now deploy this for future storms as well. So I want to show a quick video as I continue to talk uh, through this, if it'll play. So again, this system, uh, like I said, it can stay airborne for 20 to 25 hours, um, and it can cover, you know, um, what I say, a, a couple thousand miles on a single flight. Uh, so again, once this is airborne, we can keep it up in the air for for long, long periods of time, where we can now swap out pilots while it's staying in the air um, from, from the ground. What you're seeing here is some of the, the, the video feeds that we were getting back from Hurricane Ian. And I believe this was uh, actually from uh, Fort Myers Beach area, which received some of the hardest uh, impact uh, to the storm. And then as well as on the right side, you can also see some of the, the TFR, the flight restrictions that we were working with the FAA on uh, to, to put up so we could safely operate this uh, in what was at the time pretty pretty heavy air traffic due to other emergency response and helicopters in the area. So again, going back to you know a lot of first, there was a lot of great lessons learned, uh, a lot of great lessons you know working with the FAA and and getting approvals to to put those TFRs in place, so we could then get this aircraft up in the air and, and fly them. So with that, I know I probably ran through a little bit faster, but I'll, I will open up for, for any questions we might have as well. Great presentation. He does a ton of data in there. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions in the Q&A, and, and I'll start going through them and see if some of them you may have already answered a little bit, but let's make sure we, 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 we do our, our attendees uh, justice. The first one uh, comes is, how do, you, how do your teams make sure they don't uh, violate space-related policy and laws. So I'm thinking this is more uh, of the FAA airspace and policies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this again, this is why we set up a team in the house for this. Um, when I, I talked a little bit about uh, flight approvals, so we never let a pilot go out in the field and fly without first submitting their flight plan to us, which entails making sure they go through all of their safety protocols. They have checklists, just like you see in, in manned aviation as well. Um, so we're going through that. They're doing their checklist. They submit that information to my team here in the control center, and we give it a second look. So now we have their location, their planned flight information. We're checking that with um, what the current airspace, uh, what the current uh, FAA maps look like for that day to make sure that they, you know, they're flying when and where they can. Um, and if we need to ask permission, we, we also are, are, are closely working with the FAA on getting approvals to fly in some of those uh, areas where there might be a TFR or airspace uh, closed down for that. So again, like I said, it's really you know, heavily focused on, uh, again, monitoring when and where our pilots are at at all times. Uh, so we can, you know, make sure that we're following all of the FAA regulations, as well as the state regulations in certain events like this. Great. Second question. Um, I think you talked a little bit about this, but I, but maybe you can elaborate. Do you receive privacy complaints? I know in this world today with drones, you know, um, people don't know what to do and what you're using them for. And if you do, how do you mitigate um, those? Yeah, so that, that's just the topic. Again, I talk a little bit we, we, how we communicate with our customers. So really for us, the key piece is communicating ahead of time. Uh, so anytime, you know, talking blue sky operations, anytime we, we send a drone pilot out to fly, 
we're actually sending an automated phone call to every customer on that section of, of, of power lines and poles. So they're getting that automated calls telling them and informing them that we'll, there will be an FPL drone pilot in their area and that we're following all the local laws and regulations. Uh, and, and again, a privacy is a key piece to that. So when we're flying, we are only taking images of our lines and poles. And again, all of that data is stored in-house and we're required to keep that for uh, a, a couple of years uh, for safety reasons. But again, none of that ever gets out and, and leaves our company for any reason. So again, we it's, it's all about communicating with our customers, uh, being a good neighbor, and you know, and again, flying as safe as possible while you know keeping our customers' security you know at, at top of mind as well. Right. Um, there's there's two questions. There are actually three of them that are kind of kind of similar. But one of them is, uh, and I'm gonna jump around a little bit because they're they're kind of related. Um, you mentioned that you're working with a bunch of internal partners, transmission, distribution, vegetation management, uh, stationary, it's probably legal. How does Florida Power and Light share and distribute that drone data internally to all those organizations? So, uh, you know, how do they all get access to that same data? Yeah, so again, that's a, a key piece. I'm just going to cancel them so you can actually, so I can see. So again, that's the key piece why our our, our program really was centralized into FPL Air. Uh, what we saw early on in, in how our company was using drones was different business units were starting to dabble and use drones back in 2016, 2017. But the problem was everyone was doing it slightly different. Um, so as the company started growing its use of drones, we saw the need to, to centralize all drone operations in one team, which, was, uh, which is how FPL Air came to be. And in that same case, we have kind of the, the, central, uh, the central location of how we manage, store, um, collect data, and then also uh, disseminate that across the rest of the company. Okay. Um, so that takes care of the internal question. How about externally? Do you partner with emergency managers to help support detailed damage assessments for roads, bridges, homes, or other? Do you share that, that drone energy with any other your part, the partners there in Florida? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I was showing you some of that live video feeds from our large scale drone. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't previously, but this was one of the first storms we, that we were actually sharing those live feeds uh, with some of the local municipalities and local emergency services, as well as the, the Florida State Emergency Services. Um, so again, uh, again, a lot of first for us, a lot of lessons learned, but that we were able to effectively share those live streamed live feeds as they were happening with, with those emergency services, as well as we had the FAA uh, watching in on that as well uh, during those flights. Right. Um, here, here's, here's one that does it. If you were listening to any of the previous ones yesterday, we, we, we heard from a lot of uh, weather forecasters and data scientists. Um, is there any data that you don't have that you think would be helpful um, when you're considering pre-deployment considerations? Now, areas that might be prone to flooding that you might want to pre-deploy to or weather forecast data. You know, specific yeah, out there. yeah there, there's, there's a lot of information. And, and for us is, you know, on blue sky days, it's really not our focus, but we've, we've learned and we've started putting a lot of that information in place. So we, we have uh, service centers across the state so we kind of pick the brains early in storm season and we, we kind of understand when and where, and, and we'll get lists of, 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 of line sections which typically are, 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 are susceptible to, to flooding. So before a storm, we already have a list of those areas. Um, we can already have pilots kind of sitting and waiting nearby those areas. Um, so again, it's really trying to increase the awareness of when and where we have flooding typically that way we can respond faster. Like I said, if you, if you look at yesterday's um, presentation that we saw, there, there's data out there that, that you can overlay in your GIS system over your, over your facilities that um, you don't have to rely just on you know, the, the, the on the ground knowledge. There's a lot of stuff out there that that's, they're getting really accurate with it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for us, it was, it was a lot of, there were a lot of lessons learned, especially uh, due to the, uh, the flooding that you saw around Arcadia. Um, and then when you have flooding, you have, you know, we had a lot of highway shutdown, so people couldn't even get there. 
Um, so for us, it's, you know, you know, really thinking ahead and pre-deploying those pilots. So they're already there and waiting before it even happens. Um, so again, we don't run into the logistics uh, of, of trying to get pilots from the East Coast to the West Coast of Florida uh, during events like that. Yeah. Here's one, I think you talked a little bit about this, about the, you know, the, the gathering this data and then getting it to the people that need it. Have you considered using cellular connected aircraft to automatically send the imagery back to the cloud? What aircraft are you using for beyond visual line of sight flights? And I think you showed us a picture of, of that FPL Air One there. So you may have answered most of that, but anything else you can add to that? Yeah, so I'll, you know, two questions there. The first one, you know, how are we removing data? Um, so typically in the past, it's, we've been really reliant on cellular, cellular data. But, you know, what we saw on and for Ian, for, yeah, for Hurricane Ian in Fort Myers area, there was no cell phone reception for the first week. Um, so luckily, we had been testing for the last year Starlink satellite communication, and we had a handful of teams on the West Coast with those uh, mobile and ready to go. So that was a huge tool and a huge benefit to our teams uh, for, you know, having really, you know, good communication so they can begin uploading data from the field. Uh, and I think it's something we're going to expand, continue to use, you know, years to come and, and you know, continue to bring in more of those types of uh, Starlink systems. Um, on the side of uh, beyond visual line of sight, uh, you know, outside of the large drone, which, of course, is ultimately long range outside of line of sight, but our under 55 pound program, we're using a lot of the same drones that, that any other emergency service is using. We're still heavily uh, using a lot of DJI drones. Um, we're using Parrot, uh, which is another, uh, because they have a lot of uh, U.S. manufactured uh, uh, drones now as well, as well as uh, we have some Skydios. So really for us is, you know, what's the best drone for that specific mission? What has the best sensors for, for that specific mission? And those are some of the main ones that we are operating today in, in certain in, 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 uh, emergency response situations like that. Great. Um, here's another one that, 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 that um, I think you can touch on. Are you using any sensors besides visible light, night vision, heat sensors, LIDAR? And second part of that question would be, are you, are you using any software to co convert that image into an assessment like artificial intelligence to give you, you know, broken pole, wire down, leaning pole, that type of yeah. stuff? Yeah, so um, on the smaller drones, are our drones are typically just, uh, we have the visual and thermal that we're using for assessments. Um, so that's really the primary, you know, we're, we're not doing video. We, we learned early on uh, that uh, video is not a good thing to capture because video is, is, is a lot of data and it's very hard to transfer that data. And at the end as well as somebody's gonna be watching, you know, hours and hours of this, which it just takes too much time. So on the small drones, we're really focused on, on visual and thermal. On the larger side of things, uh, we are getting uh, more involved with uh, LIDAR inspections. So on the large scale drone that you saw there, we do have uh, large uh, LIDAR, uh, LIDAR sensors capable on board that. Um, and to kind of go into more of the data side, although it's not my expertise, is, is now that we have that, that large scale drone and that LIDAR capability, we can now fly that and scan our entire infrastructure on nice clear blue sky days like today so that if and when a storm comes we can do that exact same flight profile after the storm and then using like you said the ai the back end of it we can now detect and and see is there is there a pole still there that, that was there a month ago is there a leaning pole so again using the ai instead of having people look at that data it's going to automatically spit out good pole, bad pole, or no pole at all in certain situations for us. So that's, again, a, a game changer in terms of we can fly those, those areas with LIDAR and have quick, valuable information on the number of poles that we need to address quickly. Yeah, there's been a lot of work done in that area, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm always looking at this to see the results of that because, like I said, years ago, you wouldn't even think about doing that, and today it's the art of the impossible, right? And it's just, if you can imagine it, you can probably figure out a way to, to convert that data into actionable work, work, work orders. Um, yeah, we, we, we have a team working very hard on that right now based on what we learned from Ian. And mm -hmm. we expect to have something like that in place by the, the first of hurricane season uh, this year, cool. so, which, is, which is our goal for that. Yeah. 
Right, well, here, here, here's one. It says, does FAA regulate? And that's a kind of a funny question because that's what they're there for, right? Does FAA regulate? You know they're going to regulate. What what can be considered a drone? FL, FL, uh, FPL Air One, uh, it looks like you said, it's a, it looks like a two-man aircraft. Um, seems to be well outside the norm in terms of size. How'd you get around that? Um, so again, it's it's been a long road. Uh, again, you know, this this project with the larger drone has been about a three year plus project. Uh, again, working closely with the FAA on, you know, it's it's been a learning experience for the FAA and and uh, FPL. Again, no one else has has done something of this size uh, in in the world of drones outside of you know government military use. So again, it's been a long road. Uh, and it's going to, for, for us in the FA to really understand what should that look like uh, in terms of the operation? What should the, the pilot certification of a pilot flying that drone uh, over in the national airspace look like? Um, what, what kind of training, what kind of certifications are required for that pilot? So there's, there's definitely been a lot of, of lessons learned over the last few years to get us to where we are today. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more to learn, you know, as, as we continue to operate that. Uh, in blue sky conditions in the near future as well. And I'm sure um, knowing how open Florida Pond Light has always been, you, you, you all are open to sharing those lessons learned if anybody's interested in, in, in getting into you know, this, this, this size and type of, of, of operation, you could help them with these lessons learned. Absolutely. Um, and again, uh, we have that aircraft uh, now that we're operating. There's also uh, a few that, that I know Mississippi State have now have, have been delivered. So we're also working with other users of that system so we can kind of share our own lessons learned and ideas to help, you know, bring that information together to, you know, help us all move forward with it, right? Yeah. Right, here's one that's near and dear to my heart coming from the operating end. Regarding restoration time, since it started using the drones, has restoration time improved? And if so, have you been able to measure it and just determine how, how much better it's got because of the program? That is a hard one to, I can say yes, it has definitely helped. It's provided us a lot better information in the control centers um, for the people that are making those, those tough decisions. Um, it's very hard to quantify how big of an impact drones have had because there's so many moving pieces, so many factors when it comes to uh, power restoration in terms of storms. Uh, I know for Hurricane Ian, you know, this is one of the biggest storms that, that we have experienced as a company. And to basically have uh, power restored to 95 plus percent of our customers within a two week period, uh, drones were a small piece of that, but it was, it was uh, a much bigger, bigger team involvement to, to, to make that restoration as, as fast and as successful as it was. I, there's no doubt that, that you can cut minutes hours, days off of your restoration. It's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful for your customers, uh, not only from a quality of life, but you know it has a direct impact on what they're gonna be paying for their electric bill going forward as well. So making these investments and in, 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 in these steps forward are, are, are really, really good for, 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 the, for the customer in, in a lot of ways. And there's one final question here, and, um, and, and uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit about what beneficial uses you have discovered for the aerial metadata that you guys have collected. And there must be just terabytes of data you've collected. Yeah, again, like I said, you know, for Ian, we captured about 50,000 images. And if we would have done that a year or two before, we would have no idea, you know, what to even do with that much data with that many images. So we've been working, you know, over the last year, we brought in uh, a few more people to our team, data scientists to our team to help continue to, to, to develop um, an application, which one can easily handle the upload of, of mass, you know, amounts of images and data from the field, but then how to visualize that, you know, instead of clicking one image by one, it's really trying to understand it and create a better platform to visualize the data that we're seeing out in the field. So what our team has, came, has come up with is using ArcGIS is those, those images that are being uploaded from the field, they're taking the, the GPS data on the back end, which is plotting those images on a map of where they were taken. So each area for emergency response commander in the area, they can quickly basically do walks like as if they were out in the field 
using these drone images. So they can basically virtually walk pole by pole going down the street, sitting at their command center desk. And again, that's been a huge uh, change uh, of how we, we operate and, and respond to those types of situations. That's awesome. I'll tell you, um, you blew through those, those, those questions. Uh, and I don't think we stumped you on any of them. Um, uh, and, and I'll tell you that the picture of your command center, I've been to your distribution command center. Um, uh, I got a tour there back when I was working for Dominion um, and, and been there a couple of times. It's a, it's a, if, you, if you haven't been there, if you get the opportunity to see it, it is, it is impressive. It's a, it's a, it's a, for anybody that's into emergency operations, that is state of the art. There's probably um, not very many around that are built of that quality. That that is, you're fortunate to be in that center and, and just you know seeing your command center makes me want to go back to work almost. Uh, <laughs> I haven't retired in 2019. It's good to see you're doing it. Keep keep up doing the great work. Um, and I don't see any other questions. So Heath, we really thank you so much for your time. Um, great presentation. All all of the presenters there have been been great. 